Fredemption, as uh, Al said that day in the group chat. Fredemption. I mean, he man's gone from stepping on his keeper's leg uh, um, to pressing and assisting, to, to assist, to scoring now and being like the man of the match. I mean... You get you really you really get the full full spectrum from from, yeah. from Fred here. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Al and Jerry Football Podcast with me, Jerry, and my buddy L. What's happening? What's happening? What's up, guys? How you all doing? Much love to everyone. Hopes everybody's yep. having a good week so far. <laughs> it's a good week so far. Yeah, it's been a busy one for us personally, but obviously yeah, busy one also for the players and uh, managers because it was one week of two match days. So basically, we had a match day fifteen. Match day fifteen, it was right. Oh, match day fifteen. Right, right, it was hectic. It was hectic. Sorry, sorry. We match day fourteen was during the week, so that was on a Wednesday and a yep. Thursday. Right, fifteen was so over the weekend. Is, yeah, match day fifteen was the one that just passed us, which was also an eventful one. Since that, we've got two matches here, so we're just gonna keep it chill, keep it general, and we'll talk about both. Obviously, we'll start with match day fourteen, and okay. we'll start with L, the Twitter Derby L. Twitter that's, that's, Derby. That's, that's the word on the street. See, Arsenal fans, right, and United fans, huh? The I obviously it used to be the biggest game in England right now. That that was for yeah. that, that was real. Yeah. I mean, especially during the early 2000s, I think the biggest game in England was United and Arsenal purely because of the way Wenger and and, and Ferguson had set up the teams. But yeah. now, well, it's just a it's just a derby between the fans, I guess, because yeah. it's not really made much effect on the league per se. I mean, I, I still have respect for both the teams, but I, I have to admit it is pretty much like a social media Twitter derby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, well, again, drop a, a real massive drop in quality since you mentioned the early two thousands, Keane and Vieira and all that. But but you know what? Yeah. You know what? Honestly, I thought that, I thought it was an enjoyable game. I thought it was it had its, it had its moments. Um, right. Fred popping up in both sides and Cristiano Ronaldo goals and. Arsenal, well, they're both. If you look at Man United and Arsenal, Man United, obviously, they're happier with the win. But Arsenal, I thought, should have should have been a little bit more assertive towards Man United. Let's not forget, this is a Man United side. Losing 5-0 to Liverpool at home. Losing 2-0 yeah. to City. Yeah. Very much like a training should, game. Should, should, should the goal have counted now? The first goal by Odegaard, should it have counted? That was oh, well, the biggest talking uh, point, obviously. We will, again, we, will, again, we will do a quick one today. Yeah, we no, we we definitely again look. You're looking at this refereeing decisions, and, and you know yeah. I can even make reference to the the der classica of the whole Dortmund Bayern game and the and the penalty given for the Bayern's goal last third goal. It was shocking refereeing yeah. again, you know. And I think see, the thing is, the thing is, they're consistent, but in some ways, when it comes to decisions like this, consistently bad. You know, so so I don't know whether exactly I, don't, I, I don't know whether it's 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 a it's a form of look. We're gonna yeah. give it anyhow. We're, we're trying to perfect this game through VAR because if you're gonna do that, then definitely the goal should have counted because the referee didn't blow his whistle again. If you're talking about form, right? You're talking about all this mm-hmm. sort of theoretical form. But again, mm-hmm. in in any in any sport, if your goalkeeper is down, yeah, I know, I know, Fred stomp on his feet and all of that, but. Yeah, the referee should be blowing the whistle, and if he didn't, he would have anyway. He would have seen it. He would have yeah. anyway. If it would have been two, three seconds later, you know. And 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 again, this is not like it's it's a split second, and it it, it wasn't like the it wasn't like the Allison go uh against West Ham, you know. You that was there was like split seconds happening against each other, you know. This was a point where um Smith Rowe had a touch and he knocked it into the empty net, and he wasn't even like a fierce shot whatsoever. It was just a bouncing ball that was yeah. given in terms of a VAR goal. But of course, again, I think this is the way the game is moving in. I personally don't agree with it, Jerry. I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, Arsenal, Arsenal, they had their moments. I just thought that they didn't, they should have, they should have taken the game to Man United a little bit more. You see, when whenever they played fast passing balls to the middle, Tomiyasu overlapping, what, they, what happened was that they scored, right? 
they scored right away from the Man United second goal, which Ronaldo scored. And of course, up to the pitch and yeah. Odegaard, boom, goal. But after that, they sat back. See, the thing is, they sat back. And this is a yeah. United side, you know, with, with, with really managerial transition, not so sure what's happening. So I thought, I thought the loss against Man United, really, really, I think on, on the Arsenal perspective, given the fact that they're trying to push for top four, having such yeah. good results yeah. before this, I thought that was... It's not it was a, very a blow. Good sign I think it's them. a blow for them. Also, it was. It was. It was. Blow to it was. Good form, really. It but was. It, it, it was. It is. It is. L. This is where the question again comes. You know, because you can have good games against the bottom half of the table, but it's, yeah, exactly. the fans want performances in the big games, right? Right. So the big right. games have been Liverpool, have been mm. Chelsea, have been United. And very mm. recently, Everton. I mean, we wouldn't consider it a big game, but yeah, between yeah. the fans, right? They have a lot of rivalry and in certain cases, animosity towards each other, right? So they hate to lose against each other. And I think this for a lot of Arsenal fans would not have been acceptable because, yeah. firstly, because I think Arsenal didn't attack enough on that day, especially to win they the match. Yeah. And, and it seems like Aubameyang, their best player, obviously a talisman, yeah. and the one that Ateta is picking to lead the line, obviously, mm. who was the captain of the club, is just not in a good... Yeah, just, just not up I'm, to I'm not going to go as far as to say it's finished, Al, but yeah, man's just not, not firing at yeah. all, uh, you know? Yeah. I think he's a little bit more active on Instagram than he is on the pitch. Yeah, no, he, did you see he liked the photo after the game? <laughs> yeah. So Yo, I mean, what's like, up with that, man? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I mean. So I, I guess this is, um, this is all we can really speak about. I mean, in terms of that that match, there's not much to yeah. really talk about. But definitely, I yeah. think Arsenal's missing some firepower from the front, and I think it's about time they use maybe Martinelli or Lacazette. Obviously, yeah, definitely, yeah. Obviously, we can speak about the Everton and Arsenal game, but we will speak about match day 14 first. So, I guess, right. well, L, L, eventually it was Ronaldo, like um, Ronaldo's game. Um, rolling yeah. back the years, it seemed like it was Ronaldo of the early 2000s, right? Yeah. I mean, getting yeah. the crucial goals and getting goals against Arsenal as well. It reminded me yeah. of the game at Highbury, L, where he got yeah. two goals Shushi. as well. Shushing the yeah. Arsenal fans. Exactly, exactly. But now, instead of shush shushing the Arsenal fans, he's sue <laughs> in the whole of Old Trafford. Or sue. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Even like the yeah. rest of them are joining, <laughs> joining him. Yeah, so yeah. You can yeah. tell. So I guess, yeah, I mean, that was, I can imagine how, you know, how incredibly painful it would have been for Arsenal fans mm. to lose mm. to a, uh, you know, to a misfiring like last the United team, you know, over the past yeah. few over the past few weeks. But interesting, the interesting thing about that game and about la United's last two games was the fact that Alex Tellis and Diago Dalot was in the match and mm. it seemed to have made a bit of a difference. But we'll get on to that all in good time. So another yeah, yeah. match we want to talk about from match day 14 was the Merseyside derby, right? Because yeah. However, teams play whatever their form is like on the day. The Merseyside derby is always a big game, right? And players always raise their level for the derby. Yeah. And I think Everton, Everton fans would have looked at the derby for some sort of as a game to 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 show them whether the team is ready, whether the team can perform, and everything. Rise up to the occasion. Yeah, I think they just caught the Liverpool team at the wrong time because they've just yeah. been firing on all cylinders. I mean, I think the front mm. three have been ruthless. Mm. All the front trees on the top scoring sheet, as well as Mo Salah being top of the assist charts as well. So, um, Alexander Arnold, Trent, and Basically, Mo Salah, they're top of the assist charts and Mo Salah's top of the goal-scoring charts. So, right. it seems like the team is firing. In, from an attack, attacking standpoint, I think defensively, there's still work to be done because uh, Demarai Gray got a goal there when Liverpool were 2-0 up. Yeah. But I just want to mention, I think that was a Henderson, Jordan Henderson, Merseyside derby brought to you exclusively yeah. by Jordan Henderson. <laughs> because of his performance, I think he's got a really good goal, goal. on his... Yeah, it's exactly. A really good goal in his weak foot and as well an assist for Mo Salah. And Mo Salah, of course, getting two goals and Diego Jota with another goal. And Andy Robertson right. as well being back on that day. I think it was a good day for Andy Robertson yeah. to come out again. Seems to thrive in these intense situations and was definitely one of the men of the match on the day. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what yeah. do you think, Al, about, about that game? Do you think it was a good performance and it was a big match actually for Mo Salah to get his two goals and everything? Or do you think it was just the fact that Everton weren't ready for Liverpool or Liverpool are another level? Because Everton still did create a few chances and they were on their game that day, but they just couldn't match the pace, the power and yeah. the pressing. Yeah. No, I, think, I think when Liverpool got the first goal, very much in control, got the second goal very much in control. Then, of course, Everton, Everton came back into it by, with, with the, uh, the Marai Gray goal, right? Yeah. I didn't feel it at any point that Everton were really... It's, it's, it's really, really questionable at the moment as to how long he's going to be keeping his job. Will he still be manager by Christmas? But I thought, I thought when, this, when the first Everton goal went in, there, there was a chance. There was a chance, but... As the second half came by, Liverpool just picked them off. Everton were bombing forward, trying to get the second goal, right? Trying very much to get the second goal. But Diego Jota, man, what a goal. Just rifles it in into the top corner. A turn, yeah. rifles it in the top corner. And, and, and you know, Mo, Mo Salah with, with opening up his body and just giving it in a goal. And I thought, yeah. now, this is Liverpool picking Everton off, you know, guns blazing, holding on to their firepower. And as soon as the third goal went in, I thought Everton were curtains. You know, Everton, I know they got the win and we're going to talk about them beating Arsenal in a bit. But on the day, I thought Liverpool generally were very much powerful. And, and he, he, yeah. here's, the thing, here's the thing I wanted to ask you, Jerry. And, I, and again, this is just a very small, small art question and, and maybe just to debunk the certain myths. Do you think it's a myth that Liverpool centre-backs are praised this crazy sky high? Do you think they're the reason that Liverpool are termed defensively solid? Or do you think it's the people in front of them? Do you think it's the midfield? Do you think it's the pressing um, from the front? Yeah. So, I do think that... Um, I mean, having watched Liverpool a lot over the past four years, I think in the 18-19 season, um, Van Dijk's second season, I think they were defensively solid. They lost the league to City by mm. Mm. one point, right? And I think yeah. that gone a run of 60 games unbeaten at Anfield, which stretched into the title winning yeah, season. I, remember. I think I think that was yeah. Liverpool's peak. And 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 also Joe Gomez was a big part of that um defensive dynasty, if you like to call it. That that yeah. and and, and yeah. Van Dyke was obviously voted for. I think he came third in place in the Ballon d'Or that year. I think, Ballon d'Or, I think yeah. it was second yeah. or third, I think, uh, behind Messi and Ronaldo, obviously. You know, and I think it yeah. was Messi. Uh, no, I think it was Ronaldo who won it that year. I'm not too yeah. sure. I, I can't really remember. I think that was the time where Liverpool were, had reached some sort of defensive peak there, especially Van Dijk's first two years. I think the Van Dijk injury came as a big blow because yeah. I think he is the focal point to that defense, right? And yeah. um, because just being so good on his feet and playing the ball out from behind, I think relieves a lot of pressure from the defenders. His ability to read the game. I generally think Van Dijk has made such a big difference in Liverpool's defence and it's not the same without him. And I think he has been catching up this season, albeit a few mistakes. I think yeah. um, against Everton also that day, he gave the ball away at one situation. He was yeah. too calm with yeah. it and he was pressured and he couldn't he couldn't recover. So he's lost a little bit of speed, a little bit of ground in terms of recovery, but I think he will get it Back. But Al, I yeah. think to answer that question and to move on, I think the pressing for, especially for Klopp's team, starts from the front. And I think yeah. Mane, yeah. Salah and Jota have been on it this year. And I think Jota right. has made a big difference actually because he presses, presses, presses and he does not stop, right? Firmino is smart with his pressing. You know, Jota sometimes can be quite erratic with his pressing, but he does not stop. That's the key part. You know, he yeah. just keeps running, you know, and I think that's a big difference as well. Yeah. So that was the Merseyside derby in match day 14, and we just covered it. I think definitely Liverpool were on another level on that day. Yeah, and, um, definitely. Could not be matched. Yeah. Really. Could not be matched. And I, I think they were looking to bring some sort of form into the next match day, right? And... They had faced up to... Uh, we will just cover the Liverpool game since we're talking about Liverpool already. And then we'll, we'll <laughs> cover that, I guess, on match day 15. So, Liverpool travelled to Wolves next, right? And they faced Bruno Large. Pretty solid Wolves team, right? 
Yeah. Um, I think the first few games, uh, it was really un- unlucky. I think in like the the United game, I think the Spurs game as well, early yeah. in the season, I think they were unlucky to lose those games 1-0, right? Yeah. I think United yeah. was, was it 1-0? I mean 1-0? Yeah, United won 1-0. I think Spurs as well 1-0. Yes, uh, yes. Wolves were very dominant in both in both those games. Yeah. 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 Unlucky. But the thing is, Al, I think Bruno Large has really made a difference for Wolves oh, yeah, in definitely. Terms of definitely. defensive transitions. So they're really yeah. good when it's backs against the wall. They've got a lot yeah. of because of their wide system, right? They yeah. can cover a lot of ground which doesn't leave yeah. a lot of space for opponents to exploit. And when they do, opponents do exploit that space. Like we saw so many times, Liverpool had cut Wolves open. But Max Kilman and Connor Cody were there to read the situation. Oh, yeah. Not only because they were intelligent and Definitely. smart, because they were disciplined yeah. as well. They kept the shape and did not relent in terms of the shape. But Al, do you think Jota should have scored that, right? It was definitely, oh, yeah, he was no, definitely, definitely feeling some pressure. Man. Definitely, definitely, <laughs> he definitely. Definitely scored that. He, he, yeah. he could have slotted into the left. I mean, of course, yeah. we're going to look at it and say, oh, what, what, a, what, a, what a tackle and so on, isn't it? But yeah. generally speaking, I think Jota should have definitely scored. I mean, yeah. <laughs> open goal gaping yeah. surely yeah. should have scored. But yeah, just, just to touch a little bit on Wolves, right? I mean, I didn't think Wolves were crazy dominant, but I thought they were right. brave in the game. I thought, I thought they really went, tried at least to go shoulder to shoulder with Liverpool. And, and I, I, just, I just feel that the passing forward, perhaps the front three, front four, Raul Jimenez haven't really hit top heights at the moment. I thought if they were a little bit more precise with what they were doing, you know, if you had a much younger Jao Martino perhaps to perhaps play in the game, then maybe Wolves could have gotten a little bit more precise because I thought Wolves where they were lacking in the game was the front uh, front three of the whole game. And I thought they were yeah. they were a little yeah. bit toothless, you know. Adama mm-hmm. Traore had the, had the physical presence, definitely. There was one sense of where he... I think he just bumbled down uh, Virgil van Dijk, you know, and you don't see yeah. that very often, right? Yeah. So, but, but yeah. Liverpool on the day, I think, you know, you must... This, this really reminds me, honestly, I know they're rivals and all that, but this really, really reminds me of uh, early Fergie days or rather the... For, you know, Fergie time and Fergie on his pomp, you know, and we're bringing on a striker. You saw it with Makeda, Solskjaer, yeah. and, and yeah. now you're seeing it with Divock Origi, you know, and, and Divock Origi. He scores when I, he wants. He scores, scores when, when he wants. wants. Man, I, I think, I think Origi, Liverpool should when build a statue wants. for him, lah, dude. I think really <laughs> Liverpool should build it. You look at his goals, uh, how important they are. I mean, you know, we talk every yeah. day about Mane, Salah and all these fellas, right? But, Divo the legend Origi. of Divo Origi is really, yeah, really a story that needs to be told. <laughs> correct, correct, correct. Without I mean, I goals. mean, even even Klopp and the whole team are starting to make jokes about it. Klopp said if nobody correct. writes a book about Divo Origi, he would write a book about Divo Origi. Robertson yeah, said yeah. that one day he will bring his grandkids to come see the Divo Origi statue outside of Anfield. Right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you you can tell because what I love about this whole situation is I think. He does not mind. So Divo Origi sits on the bench majority mm-hmm. of the time because of the fact that Liverpool have arguably one of the best front trees in the world in World Football yeah. at the moment. But he does not complain. He comes yeah. on and gives his best. And yeah, L, when pro. the chance comes, when the chance comes, he's little L. So that yeah. shows that he is still sharp and he keeps some yeah. sort of sharpness in training and everything. Correct. And I Correct. think that his teammates love him because he doesn't complain. He scores yeah. them amazing goals, bails them out of crazy situations. Because yeah. when I first saw the goal, Al, I thought Al, I mean, I thought Salah out, had outrun the ball. I think I right. thought his first touch was too heavy. But he managed right. to keep it in control. And it was not an easy pass to Origi because he had to catch it, turn and make a shot, right? Correct. But he right. executed it perfectly in arguably the toughest phase of play, the toughest moment in the game, which is that last right. moment where so many things right. can go wrong. So many things can be scuffed, but he made it happen. And I think you're right, Al. I think Leopold needs to have a statue of him somewhere. Al. Somewhere. Yeah. Even if somewhere. it's not if it's not right next to Bill Shankly. And we're not kidding yeah. here. This is not a joke. I repeat, this is not a joke. <laughs> this is not a drill. We think that Divock or Iggy should have a statue. At yeah, least for his definitely. tenure under Klopp. <laughs> yeah. What a legend. What a legend. So moving on from that match, I think 
I think Wolves are in a, in a, in a good way. I, I do see a high ceiling for them. I do see some progress for them. And I think they're really good and disciplined in defensive transitions. And I think Bruno Large will only get better as, as, as he progresses. Mm-hmm. So moving on, I, I guess one other game we want to talk that just happened this weekend. West Ham versus Chelsea. 3 Going to the London Stadium, Al. Going to the London <laughs> Stadium and beating West Ham is not for everybody, I guess. Yeah. Like Al not said. For everyone. Not, yeah, for not, everyone, for everyone. not for everyone. Not for everyone. Al, our, my co-presenter, Al said in our group chat that day that going to the London Stadium and beating West Ham is not for everybody. Especially this season. But yeah, Masuaku, yeah. it was definitely a scuff, right? Yeah, I think even... Yeah, me too. It. Yeah. No, obviously, you, there were a few you, talking points during that game. Uh, one of it was Mendy, obviously, who had an off day. After a long yeah. time of really, really good performances, I think mm. Mendy sort of was ha- didn't, didn't have a really great day at the office. But yeah. that's not taking away. Do you think it's definitely due to... I mean, would you think it's due to the fact that West Ham have been so persistent, have been so energetic this season and if just given that crowd a lift i remember watching um rio's podcast out this this afternoon and he was presenting the west ham game with bt spot right and mm. he said the fact that west ham have been flying this season and playing so well under Moyes, mm. it's given a fresh enthusiasm a fresh energy to the fans and he said when he walked into the stadium he said wow he could imagine any player, any manager coming here right now in this moment to play West Ham and being intimidated by their presence. Do you feel that when you watch the West Ham game? Well, well, David Moy is football genius, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, so so I mean, I mean, looking at it very honestly, I think Moyes has really shaped this team to be very strong. And right. you know, they 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 have the physical presence in the front, they've got players like Ben Rama, they've got Declan Rice improving from day to day and game to game. And you know the defense. I thought that you know they have a, they have a somewhat solid keeper. So definitely credit to them. Credit to them for coming back into the game. You know I thought I thought the goal, the second goal scored by West Ham also was just fantastically taken. I think who it was. I can't remember who it was, but it was a fantastic shot. You know and and you know it's not easy to beat a team as organized as Chelsea. You know I know I know they had a somewhat you can call it an off day. You know uh, yeah. Mandy was not really showing the form that he has been showing game to game that we've been seeing right. And yeah. definitely credit credit to West Ham. I think what they have now are very serious aspirations to break into the top four. I mean, you look, you spoke, we spoke about Man United Arsenal at the start of the game, right? And they are essentially trying to get into that top four. But you know, honestly, Jerry, I don't think it's that easy, man. You know why? Yeah. Because West Ham are flying at the moment. You know, the top yeah. three are on their own. Let's let's call them the top echelon of this whole premiership. But I think right below them. West Ham are actually playing really well. I mean, you look at it, they've beaten Liverpool at home, they've beaten Chelsea at home. That's two out of the three. I know they lost to City away, you know, and, and things like that. But credit to West Ham. I think David Moyes has found a great balance in the team and they have some serious ballers. You know, Lanzini, I thought, had a good game as well. i just like to touch a little bit about Chelsea. And I don't know whether this is too soon to say because it's perhaps going to tell us more in the weeks to come. But honestly, Jerry, if they had a striker which was firing, I think they would have been able to get an equalizer or perhaps even, you know, yep. get gold. But, you know, I know Mason Mount goals, scored. Basically. Yeah, Mason Mount scored a world deal. I thought that was a fantastically taken goal. A bit like Bernardo Silva over the, over the week over as well. Weekend, yeah, but, but, yeah. but um, you know, when Lukaku came on, and I just like to touch upon a little bit that they mentioned in the press conference as well. I didn't think he offered very much, Jerry. So I get, I, I don't know what's the situation, you know, mm. whether I think he's it match fit or not. I definitely yeah, think it will, will take time will, for him to get match fit. But you would expect from an $80 yeah, million expect, dollar signing, at least, at least some sort of contribution, um, um, mm. you know, playing with his back to goal. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. That's a typical striker. I think Lukaku can play with his back to goal and yeah. that's where he brings yeah. the whole team in. <laughs> But I definitely yeah. think Chelsea are this season are more... They seem... The same way Liverpool are reliant on their front three to perform match in, mm. match out because the mm. defence is... And, and Van Dijk is sort of getting back to fitness. I think the same for yeah. Chelsea. They are more yeah. reliant on their defence. 
Yeah, so correct. their defense correct. really bails them out and wills, wins mm. them a lot of matches. And I think yeah. the reason why they're so high up in the table this year is because of their defense, because of Mendy and, mm. and their back four. Reese James. Uh, and, or their back yeah, three, or will. their back five, yeah. how, how you want to say it. I think mm. their defense have, has been so um, versatile. I think their yeah. defense have been so progressive even. You know, it mm. doesn't, it rarely digresses. It's always moving forward and very, very energetic and solid as well. They've, they've come up with a system that's been solid. Yeah, yeah. No, and I thought yeah. Diego Silva as well. Really, yeah, really well. Yeah, exactly. Now, you know? Exactly. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's really good. I think it's really good for all Chelsea fans, especially. So, yeah. West Ham on the up. Um, West Ham on the yeah, up. West Ham on the up, really. West Ham on the up. So moving on from the West Ham and Chelsea game, obviously, Mr. Ralph Rangnick, godfather of the Gagan Press and pressing, whatever you want to call it, with, uh, I think, Al, personally, I feel with a result, he would have been really proud of. The fact mm, that United mm. kept the clean sheet, right? And um, Fred Demption, as uh, Al said <laughs> that day in the group chat, Fred Demption. I mean, he man's gone from stepping on his keeper's leg uh, um, to pressing and assisting, to to assist, to scoring now and being like the man of the match. I mean, you get you really get, you really get the full full spectrum from from, yeah. from Fred here, you know. No, but I think definitely. I think there's just one thing actually, Al. I just wanted to read you out before you tell me your thoughts on this game, right? And um, yeah, I I thought it was uh, quite solid as well because. There was a lot of talking points. He said, say, key mm. points uh, when discussing United. I think defensively, Ronaldo, Rashford, Fred and McTominay were told to press in central mm. areas, right? Correct. While correct, wide yeah. areas were left to Bruno, Sancho, Dalot and Teles. Because mm. there was a point during that match where the formation went to a 4-2-2-2, right? Yeah. But obviously, that started with a 4-2-3-1. Attacking-wise, mm. playing in a 4-2-2-2, players are closer together increasing pass options and pass completion, helping mm. to maintain possession in attack. Also, it appears that players have been told not to shoot from open play unless they are within the width of the six-yard box, which we saw from Fred. This explains yeah. why Rashford Greenwood ETC did not try to shoot from ridiculous mm. positions mm. and made better decisions on the ball in relation to their position on the pitch. So you yeah. can tell each player has a clear position each player has a clear role in the team and there are some sort of discipline and tactics being laid out yeah. by, by Ralph, even in his first game, that they have to abide by. That they just can't play how they want to play, you know? Mm. They have to mm. follow a certain system. And one, one thing, interestingly, I thought, Al, um, after seeing Fred and United try to play out from the back so many times and the first mm. ball always goes to Fred and he sort of, he has no option. Whereas mm. now, Maguire was pushing higher and he was playing yeah, out from the back correct, and correct. allowing Fred to basically press higher so he doesn't have to mm. come and get the ball and then move the ball forward. I mean, mm. let's be real here. I don't think Fred is a ball carrier. I don't think he's yeah, a ball he's player. Not, he's not a baller. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. his work is mainly off the ball and I think he's dangerous It right in front of the box, really. Um, what, what, what can you tell me actually about that? No, I thought I thought the first perhaps 25 minutes, 30 minutes was very, very informative of this Ralph Ranjit kind of style of play. Yeah? And yeah, I'm happy to see them execute it somewhat uh, you know, satisfactory. I don't think it was fantastic. I don't think it was perfect. Again, it's the first game, so you know, we can't really expect so much of positional play and so on. But you know, the thing I I honestly I was most uh, impressed with is Watching Man United play, yeah, even against Arsenal for that matter, yeah, they have been cut open very easily for at least the last 10, 11 games, right? Yeah. And I thought I thought this would happen against Crystal Palace because the thing is with Palace is that Palace are also a very high-pressing team and they are very fast and they are able to counter against you. Zaha, Olise, all these fellas, they are really fast players. But I rarely saw, in fact, I don't, I can't even remember. Crystal Palace really cutting Man United open with this sort of pace in the game. And you mentioned just now about how this whole tactic of not shooting from, from ridiculous Hollywood-like positions, isn't it? And I yeah. thought, yeah. again, this is, this, is, this is a very simple yet informative tactical awareness because the person skies it over the bar or gives a meaning, unmeaningful shot to the keeper. Keeper throws it or to the right back or full back or wherever and they're countering yeah. forward. You see, yeah. so that that really makes sense as to why he does this. The pressing definitely was. 
I I really saw a whole drop in the second half. Understandably, they must be really knackered after also playing midweek against Arsenal and so on. So of course that's understandable. So, but I generally I think when looking at United, I think United fans can be very optimistic. You know, I think in time this is going to be a very long process. You know, it reminds me a little bit about when Klopp came in and and you know players like Adam Lallana and all that were totally knackered. You know, just panting. Yeah. And of course, people like Pochettino and all of this, when you know coming in first time and looking at how they are pressing from the front and so on, it will take time. It will take time. But I think Man United look like they have some bit of tactical awareness rather than you know a four-two-three-one and and let's win the game with individual talent and so on. You know, no disrespect to any any managers before this and so on, but at least I think there is going to be a game-to-game in-game management play which they need, which definitely they need. And 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 Cristiano Ronaldo pressing, eh? That that's that's another, yeah. That's another point. I'm I'm also very impressed. We talked about top pros. Divock Origi is a definite example. But I thought Ronaldo, Ballon d'Or, the greatest ever. All this yada yada yada. But him trying to impress a new pressing style manager, I thought that was also lovely to see. Is so yeah, Al. I mean, you were saying it's lovely to see Ronaldo pressing, and I I was shocked. But uh, but to be fair, Al, I I do think that the fact that he has taken care of his body so well. Right. Yeah. I mean, you you yeah. see. I mean, you you saw it with with um. You saw it with Rio. You saw it with Frank Lampard. You saw it with Stevie. You saw it with mm. uh, Wayne, especially Wayne as well, because he was captain yeah. towards yeah. the end. You could really mm. tell that their level was dropping and dropping and dropping. Right. 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 And 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 right. to be fair, to be fair, the likes of like uh Paul Scholes, even uh Rio mm. Ferdinand, Steven Gerrard, Frank Lampard, Wayne Rooney. Towards the end, they were playing very big roles and they were given big responsibilities in terms of the midfield, yeah. in terms of captaincy and stuff like that. But I feel the fact that Ronaldo can just focus on goals and getting chances, mm. it, it narrows down what he has to do, right? I think as a striker here, if you can keep, take care of your body, I really think, I mean, you look at Zlatan now. I mean, yeah. if he was a midfielder, example, I, don't think yeah. be, I don't think he'd be playing until now. I mean, he's, he's 40 L. He's blind 40 years old <laughs> and he's still scoring goals for Milan. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. But it just shows, I think from, as a striker, I think because uh, it's, you're all about taking the chances and, and getting into the box and getting into positions and everything, I don't think it would take that much of a toll on your body like it would a defender or a midfielder. So I think, and especially, I mean, we're talking about Ronaldo here and how well he's taking care of his body, right? And yeah. um, the fact that his fitness is on point and the fact that he has a fitness of a 25-year-old uh, football mm-hmm. player mm-hmm. and with all the tests that's been done, I'm, I'm sure he, I mean, he's teetotal. I mean, he eats right. You, you can tell he's just, he's done everything impossible to, to make sure he's that he's where he is here yeah. today. E- exactly. And I think he could thrive. I think, what, honestly, Al, I think if Rani has the right fitness team behind him, I think they can add a few more years to Ronaldo. And I think... Right. They could definitely find a system just like James Milner, where he presses. He's the most, he could be even on some days, the most um, energetic on the team. But obviously, there'll be a tipping off point or there'll be a drop off point where, okay, you, you slow down a bit, you know, let yeah, the other, right. other teammates do the work. And I think that's all about the teammates working together. And it'll be interesting, I think, to see Ralph pull that together. I saw his post match, Al, him saying that um, he was firstly he was surprised that Fred Scott with his left foot if i'm not mistaken oh he's right he scored with his right yeah. foot because left uh I'm, fred is a left footer right and he had to i'm, ask I'm surprised his... that fred i'm surprised fred can even shoot with his right foot man so i'm i'm, I'm also understanding okay, even I shoot from outside the box so accurately <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, i mean man to be, to be be, fair, man to be fair to be fair l i mean l and myself well i speak for myself and, and l because you know we we we're we, we cool like that um yeah we have been on Fred since day one. We and have, we've we have, already yeah. been calling for him to be out of the team. But he slowly looks that if he if he's used well, he could be one of the best players in Ralph Ranik's. Obviously, we're yet to tell. And I think United could do with better recruitment in the future. But it seems for now, Ralph could have uses for Fred. You know, the same mm. way... Um, mm. Klopp and Tuchel, you know, had uses for Jorginho, uses for Gini Wijnaldum. You could see it. You could right, see. Right, I mean, yeah. you could probably see a different difference from Fred. Obviously, it's too early to tell. And um, mm. we, we just go by what we've seen so far. 
And I think with Ralph, I think United fans just have to be patient. Like he said, it's all about bringing stability right now. There's no point mm. promising mm. trophies and, and, and high-flying football. I think stability is right. the most important thing and they can kick off from there, right? Yeah. So yeah. moving on, Al, uh, just two quick points before we touch on the Everton and Arsenal game. Tottenham, last two games, scoring goals, keeping clean sheets. I think that deserves a mention. Obviously, it was against Brentford and Norwich, but still, I think it's something to uh, definitely yeah, a positive. something to build upon. Yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. a positive. And Conte seems a little bit more happier, like he said, even though Kane didn't get on the score sheet mm-hmm. for the last game. He, he, he did work his socks off. It's just not really happening for him this season. You could tell there's a bit of a drop-off. But... Mm-hmm. You've always got the likes of Lucas Mora and, and Hume Min Son. Did you see Lucas Mora's goal over the... Oh, yeah. Weekend? What a goal, man. What, what a goal. goal. Oh, my well God. Worthy, it man. was like a throwback to his PSG days, to his um, yeah. <laughs> Corinthians yeah, yeah, yeah. days, if I'm not mistaken. I think he yeah. played for Corinthians before he moved to PSG. But, wow, it seemed like a vintage Mora. And Mora, to be fair, Al, I mean, he's someone who you'd have expected That's more expected. goals maybe mm. Over, mm. over the years. But... You know, yeah. he's been more of the hardworking player, gets the important goals, I think, mostly. But such a nice goal. And um, always nice to see Lucas Mora do well because he's such a hard worker for the team and, and, and all around. Yeah, really energetic nice player. Yeah, yeah, all around really nice guy as well. Always, always gives his goal to God and, you know, everything. He's just mm. really nice player to watch. And, and whenever he links up with Son, I think that can be really Tottenham's uh, focal point. So moving on from Spurs, I think we. We'll speak a little bit more about them when 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 Conte has one of his crazy big matches, right? Yeah. For now, I think it's just been solid this place. Another good it, it's good to Aston see Villa, him. I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. Another good bounce back was Aston Villa after losing to City, um, a two-one win against Leicester. Um, mm, very good win for CVG, yeah, man. Yeah, it was a really good win for CVG, and just before he comes to Anfield, out so. It's going to be an interesting one. I just want to ask you on in regards to that goal just before the first half. So basically, yeah. there was a shot. Michael saves it, but he spills oh, yeah. it. And Jacob yeah. Ramsey yeah. kicks the ball in, scores a goal. His first goal, youngster for the club, yeah. his first yeah. goal. Do you think that Schmeichel had the ball under control? For me, no. Because he only had one oh, no, hand over it. And definitely, he did not have the ball under control. I no, think that was the wrong decision. He didn't. Yeah, definitely. I think that was the wrong decision. You'd expect really? better, lah. Definitely, this is like a you yeah. know a, a veteran. You know, this is your team captain. He was captain, yeah. isn't it? so I think you you definitely yeah. expect better from from Smythe. Definitely, I think that I think that was he, a he, he lost control. If anything, he lost control. Yeah. So correct call. He lost control. Yeah. Definitely. Because he had one hand over the ball, but what I do know is you need to jump on the ball. Two hands over the yeah. ball. Hold it Correct. to the chest. That's that's the definition of having the ball in control from obviously Al and myself from pre- prehistoric days because we are sort of slowly <laughs> becoming dinosaurs of football, I guess, with the way Correct. we Correct. speak about football. But back in the day when we watched football, it was two hands over the ball, ball pulled towards the chest. At least if you Correct. get two palms on the ball, it's arguable, right? Correct. You know, Correct. but I, I feel personally it was a wrong decision and... Um, yeah, we'll definitely be bringing you talking points on some refereeing decisions this year because it feels like refereeing in football right now, not just in the English Premier League, yeah, all over the world, man. in the Champions League, questionable. But what I feel realistically, I think is going through a transitional phase right now. So uh, there's going uh. to be a lot of errors, margin for errors. I think there's going to be a lot of room to sort of... Um, yeah improvise basically for referees one thing i do see l which i sort of enjoy is that the referees don't blow their whistle for small fouls but they let they let game play yeah they let the game oh, yeah. go on they, yeah 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 one thing the referees have been doing this season is letting the game flow so many times i've seen players like zaha just flop to the ground drop to the ground and the referee just like yeah. play on you know not nothing doing Whereas last time, every small thing, there was a whistle and there was right, uh, right. inquisition yeah. and everything. Yeah. But aside from this big match deciding um, decisions, this is where I think it's going through a transitional phase right now, especially with the video assistant referee, VAR, one of... One of... Um, one of, one the, of the fans who have love-hate relationships with... Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So, moving on, I think the last one we will cover is the Everton and Arsenal game. Oh, my God. I, hey, hey, I just want to ask you one question. I just want to ask you one question. Yeah. Yeah. Is it time to go? <laughs> it's time to go. 
<laughs> um, rest in peace, Claude Caligari. I think he was the one who came yeah. up correct, with that. Correct. But I, I think uh, to be an Arsenal fan, I think being an Arsenal fan nowadays, it's got to come with health insurance. <laughs> I, I, I definitely think that. I, I mean... Well, I mean, they had chances to kill the game. I, I didn't understand the decision to bring on Adi and Katia yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Brown, didn't Nicholas understand Pepe. the decision uh, yeah, to not use Pepe. Didn't understand the decision to bring on Aubameyang right at the last minute when it did not make a difference. I didn't understand the decision not to bring off Granit Xhaka when he was on a yellow card, right? Yeah. So he kept yeah. Xhaka on the pitch while he was on a yellow card. He could not make the tackle for that last goal because he was going to be sent off and they yeah. go and score. Because if Jack yeah. had brought down Gomez for that last uh, phase of play there, I don't yeah. think Gray would have scored. And, and right, that's correct. the perfect Game situation to just yeah. tactical foul, right? But Jaka can't do that because he's yellow card happy, you know? And um, I felt there was a big oversight on Ateta's part not to bring him off. I think mm. just to maintain some solidity, solidity there, your, your most trigger-happy midfielders on yellow card you bring him off, right? I mean, it's only logical yeah, yeah. to add some safety there. It's just a, a good safety net to have. And what happens? The Gray goes and scores. What a blinder, though. What a right foot whip into the, 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 the top corner, really. Uh, I think it was a great goal. And I think the Marai Gray for one point something million this season, I think that's been a steal. No, he, he's been doing really well. And... Um... Yeah, all these decisions that Arsenal makes, I think we, we've been giving Arteta some praise. So let's be fair, right, Jerry? I mean, they've had a good run. And I thought, you know, hey, you know, he's turned the corner here. But it's again, same old mistakes and him just not being able to be proactive in the decision making. And I also similarly like you, I'm questioning why as well. You know, what, why Granit Shaka is not like you don't know this sort of player and what his tendencies are, yeah. you know, silly yeah. yellow card, and of course, then cannot prevent a goal from gaping in, going in, of course, and obviously, again, bringing in, bringing in on Eddie and Ketia and and leaving somebody like Nicholas Pepe, a tricky winger, being able to perhaps get you some form of a at least an idea of a goal, you know, and and he didn't do that, you know, yeah, and him, I think, honestly. If this is going to be next game and he's still going to be stubborn in his ways and not putting out the correct formations and, and so on and so forth, I don't know. You know, I don't know whether this guy is also going to be lasting till Christmas or not. You know, we, we hate to see managers being chopped and changed, definitely. Of course, we share that same sentiment, but I think this is mistakes far too often. And again, like what I said just now, you shouldn't be losing against Everton and Man United. Lah. You know, I think we can consider them what top top six, top seven, top eight-ish teams. You know, you're losing against Liverpool City and, and uh, Chelsea. I guess I guess Arsenal fans can still hang their head and say, yeah, we're not as good as them, right? We, we can't be better than them. But losing against Everton and United, where I think Arsenal could have done better, definitely that's a big blow, lah, you know, and it looked as though they are, they are able to just creep into the top four. But a lot of, a lot of, Thomas Partey also another one I want to just raise yeah this is a guy who you know honestly Jerry I really rated at Atletico Madrid I thought this guy yeah. was a bad man he was a baller but, yeah. but he's like you know giving away silly balls and you know against mm-hmm. United as well seriously I thought he was poor he was poor last night as well I don't yeah. I don't know what's going he on he was he was I think the last two games he was really poor I think yeah. uh, he did not provide enough cover the thing the thing I think with Thomas Partey I think fitness is definitely one thing I think yeah. he yeah. mentioned in an interview quite recently that he's struggling to adapt to the new league and the form of play which is which is completely normal I understand because yeah. well that's yeah. another obvious indication that the Premier League has a higher level right now compared to La Liga. Yeah, correct, correct, La Liga quite, yeah. quite simple. I don't think it's as intense, definitely. But one thing, Al, I feel that Thomas Partey is not a ball-playing midfielder. He's not someone who can whip balls, bring the balls out from um, yeah. every presence. Yeah. He's not a Bernardo Silva. He's not a, he's a bit Kevin box-to-box. Bro- box. Yeah, a little bit more box-to-box. Box, yeah. But I feel, yeah. Al, he's more of a defender that just sits right in front of mm-hmm. the mid- And is just there to disrupt the game. Because if you remember the way Simeone plays, right? 
they disrupt the game a lot. You know, they play on the counter yeah. attack a lot, and and they have mm. midfield players like this to come and steal the ball to do this dirty work. Yeah. And I feel that uh, Thomas Partey is just basically echoing all those around him, because mm. you you see with um with misfiring strikers and, and mm. you know subpar. I mean, he's got a, he had a young uh, midfielder as a partner in Albert Sambi Lakonga. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Season. And with Jaka, who's not really consistent. So an inconsistent yeah. midfield right now and a really intense league and a fairly young team is not really helping Thomas Partey right now, you know? Not, not a very and, good idea. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, you can tell that he's um, backs against the wall and he's being challenged right now. But All right. I, 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 I did expect to see better, but I do feel that uh, Arsenal need to recruit in their midfield. And their midfield needs to be whole of a lot better to, to see out games like this. Because I agree with you, Al. I, yeah. think, I think Arsenal should not have lost to Everton. Given Everton's recent form, mm. I think it was an easy game. They could have won it with Nketiah, but you know, it was really bad miss actually from uh, header and uh, hit the back post. Even with Aubameyang there at the end, open goal, goal gaping, right foot, and he puts it wide. Not even, he doesn't even test the keeper. I feel mm. that. I should do better, Arteta, definitely. Yeah. Should do better. What I think about yeah. Arteta quickly before we end, though, um, I, I do think he's a smart, tactical, tactically uh, savvy manager who's very intelligent and, and could um, could get the best out of players with uh, you know, small resource players. But what I do feel I've seen with um, Mikel Arteta, he does have a little bit of perhaps, um, I wouldn't want to call it stubbornness, but mm. you know, he's, he seems very set in his ways. You know, in their own ways, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which which does come to bite him a bit because the best managers in the world can understand that football is a game where you have to improvise constantly. Correct, you can't correct, have one correct. idea and stick to that one idea. You need to be have a plan B, plan C even, you know, for it to work. But right, I guess that's yeah. all from us today. I just wanted to end on this point, Al. He's making a list. Mm. He's checking it twice. Going to find out if you're naughty or nice. Arsenal is coming to town. <laughs> <laughs> so so have they been really naughty or nice no that, that's the that's uh, the bigger question yeah i think uh well <laughs> i think they well they found everton nice yesterday so they decided <laughs> to very nicely give them the three points because i i feel that it was a, a christmas gift to everton really that much mm. shocking yeah. but that's all yeah, for, no, for today's <laughs> recording uh, this is Jerry, and um, thank you very much for listening, and uh, cheers, guys. All right, guys, see you all soon. Ciao, take care.